Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth Praxis Roundtable, hosted by the World Bank in Sydney in partnership with The Diplomat magazine. My name's Ian Gerrard and I'm editor of The Diplomat. As always, I'd like to extend a special welcome to everyone watching at home on APAC and over the net or listening on radio across the Asia Pacific. Today's topic for discussion is education, which is highly appropriate being here considering the World Bank is the biggest funder of education in the world, working closely with governments and NGOs alike to help all children in developing countries complete a primary education. On the panel, on my left, we have Archie Law, who is CEO of Action Aid Australia, Felicity Mitchell, a primary school teacher and trainer who has recently returned from Vanuatu, Barbara Dalfaname, uh, a year 11 student from the Solomon Islands who is currently completing her high school education here in Australia, and on my far right is Stephen Close, who is the human development specialist for the World Bank's Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea and Pacific Islands country office in Sydney. Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaims everyone has the right to education, adding that education shall be free, at least in the elementary and fundamental stages, and that parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. It's a laudable goal, but the reality, unfortunately, falls far short. A report from Germany's Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development offers up some sobering statistics. 121 million children worldwide have no opportunity to attend primary school. Many children, especially girls, break off their education early. In developing countries, only one child in three completes five years of schooling, with those living in rural and poor urban communities especially disadvantaged. The report finds that the quality of education is also poor in many developing countries. Current estimates show that by the end of four to six years of primary education, 30 to 50 percent of school leavers cannot read or write confidently and lack basic numeracy skills. Further, in developing countries, some 16 percent of 15 to 24 year olds are illiterate. Around the world, 862 million adults and young people cannot read or write, 64 per cent of them women, with a staggering 98 per cent living in developing countries. According to the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, developing countries spend an average of just 3.4 to 5.7 per cent of gross national income on education. In sub-Saharan Africa, that can equate to just $167 per student every year, compared to 5,500 per student per year in North America and Western Europe. Such discrepancies are compounded by overcrowded classrooms, poor equipment, and a lack of well-qualified teachers. In the latter case, UNESCO estimates that up to 35 million extra teachers are needed worldwide in, in order to ensure that all children have access to primary education. Moreover, the actual cost of attending school can be prohibitive. Despite the Human Rights Convention's obliging states to provide free and compulsory primary schooling for all children, school fees are still levied in at least 101 countries. And these costs have been called the main reason why many children stay away from school or break off their schooling early. Facts and figures are one thing, of course, and can vary widely from region to region. However, it's the stories behind the statistics that remain universally compelling. And this is where our panelists come in, particularly this afternoon. And as ever, once we've heard from each of them, I'm going to invite questions from the room, brief questions from the room, which is your opportunity to, to have a short say. So it's now time to uh, introduce our first panelist, who is Archie Law. Archie is CEO of ActionAid Australia, a member of the ActionAid International Network, which runs about 50 programs across Africa, Asia, and South America. Before this, Archie was UNDP's Regional Conflict Prevention and Recovery Advisor for Africa, based in Johannesburg. He has also worked with the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations in New York, was the country program manager for the Mines Advisory Group in Cambodia, and a member of World Vision Australia's Emergency Relief Team. Archie. Thanks, Ian, and good afternoon to you. Um, I suppose, firstly, just to note, this is ActionAid Australia's first outing. Um, it's a brand new organisation in Australia and is a merger of Ostcare, um, who many will be familiar with, with the ActionAid International Network. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is how NGOs are actually helping uh, to achieve two of the eight MD MDGs that focus on education. So that's 25% of the MDGs are education related. We've already missed one on gender parity, uh, which was due to be achieved in 2005, and the other being universal primary education. Uh, the main focus of our work is how do we enable people to claim their human right uh, to education. 
I think Ian's uh, very uh, accurately portrayed the many challenges that are presented in education. But there is actually some good news out there. The good news is that we do know that we know what needs to be done. Um, and education for all can actually be realised in our lifetime if we prioritise it highly enough. What I'd like to do in a few minutes is really just uh, walk through what we've been doing with education uh, as NGOs and then to outline uh, a new approach um, that we've been adopting as well as a couple of other NGOs. Uh, in the 70s, education from the NGO perspective focused largely on access for the individual, largely funded by methodologies such as child sponsorship, focusing on making sure kids had uniforms, uh, school fees, books, and obviously that didn't work. Uh, the support was random, it was inequitable, you could have a sponsored child sitting next to a non-sponsored child in a classroom in many schools and see the inequity if in fact kids were in school. This was replaced in the 80s obviously by more of a bricks and mortar approach when we all rushed out and tried to build as many schools as we could. Um, particularly working in schools that were in very poor areas with limited infrastructure. Um, I know that ActionAid, we went through a deep analysis of this. Uh, we found that after 16 years of building schools, that had no notable impact on school enrolment whatsoever. All it meant was about 50% of the children in areas where NGOs were working didn't actually have access to education, um, largely because of the costs that were, that were required for them to attend school. Um, also, it didn't have any real impact as far as training of teachers, um, provision of teaching materials, curriculum development, etc. So this was moved, well most moved on from that. In the early 90s there was a move on to non-formal education, uh, driven by the need to, to help poor children, active involvement by parents, flexible timetables, local teachers, education in mother tongues, participatory methodologies, Again, our learning out of that as Action Aid was that this wasn't sustainable. Government wouldn't take these uh, non-formal centres on, and often government funding was withdrawn from those centres. Um, there was no transfer of non-formal education into formal systems, and in a sense, we felt we were messing with kids' lives. Um, and I suppose one of the main outcomes is what we were doing is NGOs were actually absolving governments of their responsibility to provide education for their people uh, by us taking that role. What we've seen is a shift over the late 90s, early 2000s to enabling communities to actually demand quality education and working with governments on how they can effectively deliver it. And I'd like to run through a couple of examples on, on how we do that. And I'd just like to put budget figures at it just so people get an understanding of what you could do conventionally and what you could do with a, with a new school approach, let's say. A $2,000, like conventionally, you could build an extra classroom uh, at a country like Tanzania, for example, benefit about 100 children. Alternately, what you could do, and I know what we've done with a, a national organisation in Tanzania, um, is to fund research on why children were unable to go to school and that research showed that user fees were actually the problem in Tanzania and we launched a campaign to abolish user fees which was partially responsible for an extra one million kids enrolling for school the next year. Uh, on a 20,000 budget, conventionally you could open a non-formal education centre for two years. Um, we've seen this in Bangladesh where this is happening. 100 poor children who don't have access to schooling have access to schooling. I suppose new school approach could be actually what we're doing, training community audit groups in Bangladesh, monitoring on whether the education budget is actually arriving in practice at the school level and whether it's being used appropriately. Um, in our experience, that's improved the performance of government schools and led to outreach across many hundreds of thousands of kids. On a $200,000 budget, conventionally that would fund a whole rebuilding of a primary school in a country like Pakistan after the, the earthquake a few years ago. Um, or alternately, I suppose new school, um, that money can be used to build a broad national alliance, um, which was used to build the Pakistan Coalition for Education 
to help make education a national priority and that coalition and that campaign was largely responsible for an increase uh, from 2% to 4% of GDP that was made available for education. Um, Two million dollar budget, what can you do? Conventionally, you could do something like Oprah Winfrey's done. You can fund a secondary school for girls in South Africa for one year. Um, and that's a wonderful, generous gesture by someone like Oprah. But ultimately, that supports the whole global campaign for education for one year. Um, and what that does, that includes the Global Action Week in April, where I think the figure is 10 million people in 120, million, 120 countries are engaged in it, notables like Nelson Mandela and Queen Rani are also in, involved in that campaign. And I just use those examples just to sort of flesh out. It's not necessarily the, the hard side that's important, it's more the relationship between uh, the state and, it, and its citizens. So in concluding, I think really what's required is a harmonised response to education. How do we coordinate support behind a government plan to address the education challenges in a country? We think the Global Education Fund that's being currently explored by Obama with figures being thrown about of $2 billion to provide a centre point, that could be a pivotal opportunity. But ultimately, universal access to education is achievable in spite of all the challenges. Um, it would be a landmark for humanity when we do get there, and I think we do need to be positive. Uh, we all need to be part of it. Okay, thanks, Anne. Lovely. Thank you very much, Archie. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Felicity Mitchell. Felicity is a primary school teacher who has recently spent 12 months as an Australian youth ambassador in Vanuatu, where she worked as an English as a second language teacher trainer, spending time with local teachers across three schools on two small islands in Schaefer province. So over to you, Felicity. Thank you. During my 12 months as an Australian Youth Ambassador for Development in Vanuatu, as Ian said, I worked in three schools across two islands. And my role was to work with the staff at those three schools to help them improve their English as a Second Language program, as well as their teaching in general. In the school where I was based, there were only enough textbooks for about one between three students, and not a single one of those textbooks had every single page. In 2007, the Year 8 students at this school were achieving marks of between 12 and 15 out of a possible 200 in their nationally administered exams. After eight months of my working with the staff at those schools, sharing the benefits of my teacher training and my experience, the following year, the Year 8 students all achieved a minimum mark of 100 out of 200. Some of the students achieved top marks in the province and one student won a position at the top school in Vanuatu. The follow-on of this was a massive sense of pride and achievement in the community and it resulted in so, uh, increase in enrolments the following year in 2009. There was a renewed, sen renewed sense of faith in the ability of the teachers and in the idea that it's worthwhile to send the children to school. As an educator, I naturally believe that education is the foundation of the development of a community. And working, working with teachers in Vanuatu really confirmed that for me. Because the result of an entire year eight class passing their national exams is that at least f academically, each one of those children has an opportunity to go on to high school and perhaps onto university. And maybe Vanuatu will have one more doctor or one more teacher, or one more engineer. To improve education worldwide is of course a massive goal. And I guess one of the really big questions is where do we start? Well, my experience shows me that beginning with the teachers is a positive first step to success. Well-educated teachers with current pedagogical ideas and a good set of skills to be able to pass on to their students is key to developing an education system as a whole. In many parts of the world, children travel long distances to come to school, and families work really hard to be able to afford the school fees to send their kids to school. And often, when the children show up every day, having walked or ran or climbed or paddled a canoe for sometimes many hours to be at school, they're really let down by inadequately trained teachers and inadequately resourced schools. Inadequately trained teachers is part of a major problem in education. 
And there's many complex issues involved in this, but my experiences show me that an improved quality of teacher education is one step closer to a vastly improved program. Some schools are in such remote and hard to access places that getting books and other important resources to them is logistically and financially impractical. What's not impractical though is getting the staff at those schools access to quality teacher training. If the teachers had the benefit of excellent teacher training themselves, it would impact positively on the students in those schools, irrespective of the resources available on the school grounds. And this is something that it's not impossible for Australia to provide. We can fund projects that send Australian teachers into developing countries to share their wealth of knowledge and experience. And we can also assist in improving the quality of teacher training facilities, such as local universities. I'm in the position I am today as a result of my education. And I could not possibly be here without it. I imagine it's the same for many of you. We are really lucky in Australia to have an excellent education system. From early learning centres right up to universities, our students and our teachers have the benefit of the best education available. And because of this, I believe that education is an area in which Australia can really make a difference in terms of international development. It's as easy as sharing our wealth of knowledge in current teacher, effective teaching practices. Further to that, an improved standard of education in a developing country has the potential to genuinely improve that country's capacity to sustain the projects that are begun by NGOs and aid organisations. A well-trained teacher is a long-term resource and an investment in the development of a community. A few buzzwords that I hear a lot in development discussion are sustainability and ownership. These are both fantastic concepts, and for them to occur, no matter what the project is, we must be in partnership with functionally literate, critically thinking, empowered people. An NGO or aid organisation is never going to be able to walk away from a project and reasonably expect it to be sustained locally if they're not leaving it in the hands of well-educated people who have the skills and the confidence in themselves to be able to continue to function independently. And in order to achieve this, we need to make it a priority to educate and empower future generations to go beyond the need to rely on international aid. My experiences highlight that it is possible to achieve this by prioritising the funding of effective teacher training in, it, in developing countries. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Felicity. OK, we're moving on now to, uh, to Barbara Dalfaname. As I said, Barbara is a Year 11 student, currently at William Clark College, is that right? Uh, and uh, she grew up in a small village in the Solomon Islands. After excelling in her studies at village level, and I mean really excelling in her studies at village level, she transferred to a school in the country's capital, Honiara. And then at the start of this year, in February, she moved to Australia to complete her high school education. And as I said, she's currently in Year 11. So, Barbara. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so. As I already said, I'm just going to talk about my personal experience as a student in Solomon Islands. So I'll start right from the beginning. So I started school in a village, like yeah, in one of the villages in Solomon Island. And when I was there, the total students in our school was about 240. And there was only like eight teachers for all of us. And sometimes like during the years, we just have four teachers. and. They like shade for all the classes. And most of the teachers were untrained, like they were form five, form six dropouts. So yeah, they had no training in teaching, but they just taught us. And we were basically taught um, English, math, science, and community studies. We just, like everything is just general. And we had no library, no anything, just the teachers writing things on the board and we just copying them down. And school started at 9 a.m. and finishes at 12. So, yeah, and I remember at one stage when I was in primary school, we had to like share, share one class, like two grades had to be in one class with one teacher using one board and teaching us. So, yeah, and sometimes the teacher usually go on strike because the government doesn't pay them. So 
like they tell all the teachers to go on strike, so we, we have no teachers for like a week sometimes. And I remember once we had to like sneak to school because the teachers were on strike, so yeah. And it, that's like a typical village school. Like some of the schools in town will be a bit different, but that's a typical village school. And then when I was in grade six, I had to do like an exam, which is like a nationwide exam for like all grade six. And like if you fail the exam, then you're like out of the education system. So luckily I've passed and then I got accepted into um, a national school, like one of the best schools in Solomon Islands. It's a boarding school and a church school. And it's a really old school because at, in the 60s, I think it was a mission school and they slowly changed it into a secondary school. So all the buildings were really old. Like the buildings were the ones that my dad used when he went to that school as well. So yeah. And currently they're still using the manual typewriter and manual photocopier thing. And there's only like four computers for students from year seven to year 13. So yeah. And the living conditions were not that good. Like in some of our dormitories, like in all of our dormitories, we had doors, but there was no locks. Like we just used nails and then like fold them onto the door so that they yeah, used them as locks. And I always dread when night comes because we sometimes have break-ins, like people coming in and breaking in. Yeah, like I remember one, we had like break-ins for, oh, for a week, like people coming in every night. So we had some securities, but the school can't afford to pay them. so. Some of the prefix ended up being securities for us because of the break-ins, so yeah. And the bathrooms were really bad. And like sometimes the water doesn't come and like when it does come, 200 or so girls will line up at 10 taps and with buckets and that's your shower for the day, just one bucket. And yeah, and but in terms of teachers, we had some really good expatriate teachers, like teachers from Australia and other countries coming to teach us, so it's really good. But it's be, it's, a, it's an isolated school from other schools, so most of the Solomon Island teachers usually don't want to come because it's far away and it's in the village and yeah. But um, sometimes we just go with our teachers for a particular subject for a month and then we just live like that until we have a substitute and yeah. And um, like last year my friends they're still at the same school. They had no much teacher, but they were going to do like a really big exam at the end of the year, but they had no much teacher for like half of the year. So yeah, and this, that school is a church school, so the school rules are really, really strict. Like girls are not allowed to wear sleeveless shirts, and yeah, it's really strict. And the motto of the school was to learn to live, and that's what they taught us. Like we had to make gardens after school, at the lawn in the school, helping the kitchen duties, and yeah. But I liked the school because in terms of seriousness with the school and studies, everyone was like into it. There was a lot of competition and everyone like wanted to score over 90% and things, so yeah, it's really good. And like you get to know more kids. Like most of, like, not most, but like some of them went to university in Fiji, so it's really good. And then when I was in year eight, I had this really amazing teacher from Africa. His name is Mr. Obini, and he kind of, recognized that I had some great abilities, like potentials to like do more than I'm doing there at the school. So he started talking to my parents, like like sending me somewhere to have a better education. My mom wasn't really keen with the idea at first, but my dad started talking her into it and he finally agreed. And then one thing led to another, like they started talking with some of our friends in Honiara who are from Australia. And then they met the principal from the William Clark College and they offered me a scholarship. So now I'm doing year 11 in Australia. I was really scared like, at the thought of, whoa, going to Australia, it's really hard for me. But by encouragement from my friends and family, my mom and dad, yeah, and I finally gave in, so yeah. And so I had to move because I'm a village girl, so I had no idea what the Western life was like. So I had to move to Honiara to live with an Australian family so that I might get used to the Western life before coming to Australia. It was really hard for me moving, but yeah, I did it. I was really, and I was really terrified of the idea of coming to Sydney, yeah. And, but then, yeah, I came, so here I am. <laughs> so like, in the Solomon Islands, the education system is like a matter of fail and pass. Like, if you fail an exam, then you're out of the system. Like, 
you out. But yeah, the first elimination is in grade six, and then the second one is in form three, which is year nine, and then year 11. And the year 12 one, like form six, is like the Pacific one. It's like for all the Pacific students. So the number of students who fail increases as you grow up. And then in form seven, more students get out, like they drop out. And then only the ones that pass have scholarships in the universities at Fiji, or Vanuatu, or PNG. So yeah. And uh, another thing that I found out found out is that the way we learn in Somos, like the way they taught me in the Somos, like until I came here, my perspective of education or schooling is like going to class, listening to teachers, writing down things, and then studying for the exams. Like everything is just theory, like just retelling what the textbook say or what the teacher says into the test paper and that's it. Like practicality is like, it's not part of my perspective of education. But when I came here, I was like, wow, I'm like, just amazed of how students are taught here. It's just amazing, like listening to students, like asking teachers questions and like giving their own opinions and teachers having one-on-one -on -one discussions with students. It's just really amazing for me. Like I was waiting for Miss Skinner once and in her class and I saw all these um, grade two students, they were like giving in their ideas about transportation and they were planning up things and I just like, oh, I like, I don't think any year two students in the Solomons will be able to do that because, like, we're not, I mean, uh, we're not used to that giving us sort of like your own ideas and things. We just like listen to the teacher and that's it. So, yeah. But, um, but yeah, uh, I'm, I've, the thing that I find really amazing in Solomon Island students is that they really embrace education. Like, they really like, it's really important for them. I have friends there who like, they have really big dreams for the future, but it all depends on their scores, like how well they score in the exams. So if they fail, then the chance of achieving the goals is really, really low. So yeah, I'm just very grateful for William Clark College for giving me this chance for having education here. And yeah, thanks for everyone as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, that was great, thank you. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce Stephen Close. Um, as a human development specialist, Stephen provides flexible strategic operational and analytical support to World Bank task teams and client governments in the health, education and social protection sectors. Stephen works on health and education system strengthening in the Solomon Islands, education system strengthening in Timor-Leste and social protection work in Fiji. And he is particularly engaged on questions of operational effectiveness in fragile states. Before joining the World Bank, Stephen spent seven years working on various AusAid country programs, including the Pacific Islands. Stephen. Thank you very much. I, I'd like to start by qualifying that I'm not a Pacific Islander, so I'm, I'm probably not the best qualified to speak about the status of, of education systems in Pacific Island countries. But as, as an outsider, I'd, I'd like to share some of the ideas um, about what is going on in, in education systems in the Pacific and what are some ideas to um, to improve the situation. And I, I think uh, following all these excellent speakers, there's certainly not going to be any contention from me about the concerns uh, in, in education experience. I think it's, it's pretty clear from Barbara's um, uh, talk that going to school in many Pacific Island countries is not a fun experience. Students are going to the same classrooms that their parents went to and uh, there isn't a lot of flexibility in the way that teachers teach um, and there's not a lot of options um, in education paths and once uh, students have an exam if they don't do well in it for whatever reason that's often their last chance. I, I think it's important to recognise the achievements that have been made in education in Pacific Island countries because Pacific Island uh, countries have been working very hard, uh, Pacific Island governments have now uh, most, mostly allocated um, around 20% of government expenditures to education, which matches the International Education for All benchmark. So it's not a question of insufficient resources going to the education sector on the part of either donors or Pacific Island governments. What has been achieved are relatively high levels of primary school enrolment, so access to primary school in the first place. Is, uh, has, has improved a lot. And also, in, in terms of gender, um, the problem now in some uh, Polynesian countries is that there are more girls uh, going to secondary school than boys. But in, in terms of gender in many Pacific Island countries, 
um, gender disparity has, has ended in primary schools. And basically core systems are working. Um, even in, in Solomon Islands now, um, there are more regular payment of teacher salaries, for instance, which means that teachers are more likely to be in school uh, teaching students. Um, regular systems like examinations are also, are also working. So the, many of the core elements are there. But unfortunately, all these achievements haven't translated to improved learning outcomes, at, at least in, in recent years. And it's important for us to ask why this is the case. Um, Archie uh, suggested uh, many of the reasons, as well as Felicity and Barbara, that in achieving improved learning outcomes, Pacific Island countries and, uh, and the, uh, the donors that support them need to allocate resources to needs and outcomes. And that needs the consideration of a few ideas such as results-based management and building the evidence base for improved decision making. I guess thinking of some of the priorities now, uh, I, I mentioned the increased access to primary schools. What's happening in secondary schools is uh, still a major issue. Secondary schools are at high cost um, and it's a challenge for Pacific Island countries to deliver secondary education, especially in remote areas. So in Kiribati, Vanuatu and Solomon Islands, many students travel to Honiara, as, uh, tra travel to the capital cities as Barbara did to Honiara to get their secondary education. That's a, a critical constraint to continuing in education. There are still barriers to access, especially for the poor. It's worth considering user fees issues. It's not necessarily that fee-free education is going to be the answer to improve learning outcomes if the, uh, if the country doesn't have the resources to support fee-free education. Um, for instance, with an expansion of facilities and an increase in the number of trained teachers. Quality is emerging as a major issue, um, especially now that access particularly to primary school is less of an issue. What then happens in those primary schools and secondary schools? The quality of that education, the quality of the, the training that teachers get, for instance, as, as uh, Felicity was discussing, is critical to how well students do, so what, what the learning outcomes are for students. And then there's a question of what next. After education, after kids have been to school, there's a, a growing youth demographic in Pacific Island countries and a growing phenomenon of educated unemployment. Kids getting education but then not having the skills that are needed in their economies, in their workforces, and having limited options beyond school. And that is a recipe for frustration amongst Pacific Island youth. So it's worth thinking as part of an education system approach. What is the school to work transition? What works? So I'd like to, to raise a few ideas of what seems to work, because certainly we, and certainly Pacific Island countries, don't have all the answers in place already. But some of the things that, um, that work are having qualified teachers in place. Um, teacher absenteeism continues to be an issue. There's an example of in COSRAE in the Federated States of Micronesia where it's acknowledged that schools are going to close sometimes due to traditional events. So instead the schools agree to make up those days at another time. Having operational expenses to support learning materials and the, the uh, teacher, teacher materials for instance is critical. That can be done through introducing school grants uh, or improving school grants policy. In many Pacific Island countries, the degree to which uh, education budgets go to teacher salaries is something like 90%. Considering the allocation of resources within an education system, for instance, by having a dialogue between ministers, ministries of education, development partners and ministries of finance, to think about what are the issues in our education system, what is the information telling us, and uh, how can we allocate resources to best meet the needs, especially to best meet ne the needs of the poor. This also brings in the role of communities in education systems because as in Solomon Islands, the Ministry of Education is not going to be able to meet all of the education costs uh, to, to meet the aspirations of all Solomon Islanders. In a, in a tight fiscal situation, that's pretty much clear. So what is the role of communities in helping to manage their schools. Ministries of Education have the responsibility to delegate authority to schools to have more authority over uh, how 
local problems are addressed using local resources and using national resources. When school principals and communities are empowered together to solve their own problems, it's a start to end the blame game and uh, to, uh, to fix problems sustainably and locally. So I guess a few strategic options that come out of uh, some of these ideas. Strategic plans are in place, that's an achievement in education sectors, but it's a priority to cost them based on uh, the information available about information systems. And that involves hard trade-offs um, that should be informed by debate with the community. Uh, another strategic option is uh, partnerships with the private sector and communities so that all stakeholders have uh, a part in improving learning outcomes in education systems. Improving the school to work transition, for instance, by making school education systems more responsive to demand. Thinking about how communities can be encouraged to uh, uh, send their kids to school and access education flexibly, whether it's through, whether it's through formal education or non-formal education, or even second chance education, as Barbara mentioned, when kids uh, uh, fail in their exams, often that's the last chance there should be more flexible re-entry opportunities for people, even in adulthood, to gain an education and to gain the skills, practical skills they need to, uh, to get a job or uh, employ themselves. Those other strategic options are to delegate authority to schools, to improve the information systems. Many information systems are already there, but it's a question of making them accessible and useful for decision makers as well as uh, accountable and transparent to the community. And consider how to overcome uh, those barriers to access. So I'd, I'd like to share some of these ideas. Some of them are already being worked on in many Pacific Island countries, and it's difficult to speak about all Pacific Island countries at the same time because their experience differs. But uh, I, I, these ideas are being tried out and can be shared across Pacific Island countries. Cool. Lovely. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask for questions from the floor in a second. I just wanted to turn to you quickly, Barbara, and, and just get a sense um, from you of why you think school or why you think education is important. Um, right. like, like I already said, like, in the songs, like, if you're not educated, then you're just doing nothing and just Thing like that, so we have no job, and life is really hard. So I think education is good, so that you can get a job and then, yeah, help other people. And for you, what what, what would your job be at the end of it? Um, I was thinking of becoming a doctor and like going back and help the people in the Solomon Islands. So live and work in the Solomon. Yep. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, guys, uh, I'll open it up for uh, for questions from the floor now, please, if we if we have any. Hello, my name is Hanan Tadras. I'm from Papua Education Aid and I'm working on a project in West Papua. And um, we're looking at rehabilitating quite a few schools in some of the remote villages there. And um, so it was just our goal to ensure that a lot of the kids there are literate and, you know, can do the ABCs. Um, my concern is what you mentioned, Stephen, is the um, what happens next. And you spoke to this about the school to work transition. So I'd like to just hear a little bit more about that because I'm really concerned that we're going to educate some of these kids and there'll be a lot of social problems and frustration just out of the fact that they've worked for so long and so hard for the education and then no work, no money. Steve? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking that, that important question. I guess um, this is a very difficult area uh, for education systems to resolve. And traditionally, one of the approaches has been to increase the amount of technical education in secondary school um, to help balance out the, uh, the academic focus of education. However, that can be also problematic if uh, an education system can't afford to uh, provide the learning materials for a basic education. It's going to struggle to provide the materials for a technical education. And also the experience in many Western countries has been that that technical education doesn't actually qualify students in secondary schools to go straight into a job afterwards. It, so the international experience is more that in secondary school you learn how to learn. You learn the basic adaptable skills that the ever-changing international knowledge economy then takes and trains in their specific area. 
One, uh, one optimistic area has been uh, the recent uh, um, trends in rural training colleges in the Solomon Islands, for instance. Um, there has been a lot of concern about the quality of education that uh, has been given in rural training colleges and uh, the limited resources for learning materials, for instance. But by developing practical arrangements with uh, employers in the community, um, and workplaces in the community and, and uh, different people in, in uh, rural areas. Rural training colleges are able to put their students on work placements, which means that the rural training colleges themselves, as well as the students, have a better idea of what skills are needed in the community. And the anecdotal experience has been that the rate of em employment of graduates has gone right up which means that the interest and the demand from communities for that kind of education has also gone up because uh, parents aren't going to send their kids to uh, colleges where uh, the kids don't have a hope of getting a job. So some of these practical arrangements, um, not necessarily dependent on uh, strong central planning of, uh, of um, vocational training, is, is one good experience. But having qualifications frameworks so that employers know just what skills uh, students are coming out of education systems with, uh, and so, they have, so that schools and employers have a language to talk to each other in, can really help address that problem uh, that many Pacific Island countries face of having a large number of unqualified students but a large number of jobs such as teachers, nurses, doctors, engineers that are going unfilled. Is, is there also a danger of uh, people who uh, reach a certain level of education and then go overseas to, to chase bigger bucks, essentially, and uh, rather than putting what they've learnt, sort of bubble being the exception there, putting what they've learnt back into the community? I, I think I, we, uh, this is a really interesting issue uh, for the World Bank, especially recently, and we would encourage uh, uh, people in Pacific Islands to approach this issue of labour migration uh, constructively, mm. that people moving overseas is not just uh, a negative. Obviously it has a major impact on uh, an education system and a health system when nurses and teachers are chasing bigger bucks overseas. But then the social impact of uh, remittances being sent back, for instance, can be very positively, uh, very positive economically. Pacific Island countries, uh, we think, should think about how they can uh, best use that to their advantage because it's difficult to stop people moving overseas for better opportunities but what Pacific Island countries can do is think about how that can be uh, that can work to their advantage. Mm. Yeah. Archie, Can please. I say something quickly too? I think the whole remittances issue is obviously interesting and in fraught with risk as well I think opportunities but also great challenges as far as how equitable is the distribution of remittances when they come back into a country. But I'd also like to raise, I mean, the key driver in rural development is agriculture and the key area that has not had sufficient investment from, from governments and from donors and from the NGO community is agriculture. And I think that's, there's great untapped potential there uh, to actually absorb a lot of uh, skilled people, intelligent people coming out of schools uh, into the agriculture sector. It just needs some lateral thinking on behalf of all of us as well. Can we have another question, please, from the floor? Yes, please. Sure. My name's Frank Hutchinson. I'm from the University of Sydney. I'm also from the University of New England. Uh, uh, the question relates to two aspects. One, one I, I, I thoroughly agree with Felicity in terms of the, the priority that needs to be given to, to teacher education, because we, we don't just see that in the Pacific Islands. We also see similar sorts of problems in countries such as Australia. I mean, there are critical issues around uh, ensuring that you've got quality edu education for teachers, and that actually then flows into the curriculum. The question that I would like uh, the panellists to, to address uh, in terms of levels of engagement uh, in, within communities, and I'm using community in the sense of the community within a school and the local community and the national communities in which these education processes are occurring, how do we ensure processes that enable the kinds of curriculum offerings to be meaningful 
in these contexts? How do we ensure that? So there's a level of engagement by teachers on the one hand, so they feel that they've got an ownership of what's happening, so they don't feel disillusioned, they've got something thrust upon them, and the students themselves feel a sense of agency, what Felicity talked about in terms of actually empowering students in terms of meeting their visions for a better future. Thank you. Felicity, do you want to fill that one? Sure. Um, I think uh, I spoke about um, the potential to fund uh, organisations that send Australian teachers into developing countries to share their wealth of knowledge. And this is where I believe that comes in. It's all very well to bring all the teachers into one central place and uh, give them a talk about this is how to be an effective teacher. Um, but in, in my experience that results in all the teachers going back and sitting in front of their class and going, oh, hmm. Because there's, there's no personality to it, there's no individualism to it. So I feel that that can be in part addressed by putting teachers in communities where a teacher like myself and my role yeah, as it was in Vanuatu, you get to know the community and understand the context of the classroom and the village and the culture, all of which are vitally important. And you can take uh, the wealth of experience that that teacher has and uh, get them to adapt it and change it and go, well, this is how I do it in this classroom context. Let's try this in this context. If it doesn't work, teachers are an incredibly adaptable people and I think that they're really well placed to be able to make things relevant and to be able to see when it's going awry and, and bring it back onto course. So I think getting, getting teachers uh, to peer share is a really positive step forward. I, said, I know myself, the, the best learning I do uh, is when I sit in somebody else's classroom or I sit and have a dialogue with a peer and uh, steal some of their ideas and share some of mine and, and talk about how to make things appropriate on an individual level. And I think that's a really good way to be, uh, to see genuine results and be genuinely effective. Uh, when you were in Vanuatu, Barbara was saying that many of her teachers weren't particularly well educated themselves. Did you come across that in, in Vanuatu? And were you sort of being a teacher on two levels in, in some ways? Absolutely, yeah. Um, several of the school, uh, the teachers uh, in the school where I was based um, had got to about a year 10 level uh, themselves, which I looked at being probably a lit uh, literacy level in Australian context of maybe grade five or grade six. Mm. Uh, and then they had been employed by the school um, to be of assistance, you know, in a, te in a teaching role. And uh, every teacher I saw in that context was doing the very best they could, uh, but they didn't have the benefit of the uh, teacher training that the qualified teachers did. Um, and they also didn't receive the benefit of being able to access um, uh, professional development courses yeah. like the, the um, qualified teachers were. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess coming back to your point, sir, that makes it quite quite difficult because teaching is a, is a profession that requires the teacher to be able to think on their feet, to be able to, to adapt, to come up with the, the sort of ideas that you were coming up with. And if they haven't got that life experience, much less the, the training, the formal training, that's going to be even harder. How, how can we address that, Archie? Yeah. Ian, I think we need to look at the core issues here. I mean, there are some countries, let's go outside the region briefly, like Senegal, 50% of teachers in Senegal don't have a secondary education, for example. And, and why is that? I mean, why aren't teachers getting paid enough that they actually stay as teachers and then are educated as teachers? And there are lots of reasons. Um, an organisation called the International Monetary Fund has a huge responsibility on this issue. And the IMF is pledging to reform over the course of this year. And I'd put the IMF in the middle of it. They're the ones who tell governments there's a public sector ceiling on, on wages, or, or let's say, sorry, on, on expenditure in general, but the biggest single component of a budget is usually wages for teachers, actually, in many countries. And so in that ceiling, if you can't actually get above it, um, what, what are governments meant to do? And when there are cuts, where do you make your cuts? You make your cut to the biggest item, that's teachers. Teachers are going down, so teachers are going out of business. And I'd sort of say when you've got the IMF actually in the middle of this preaching, um, there's no budget deficits, even though rich countries are running deficits everywhere these days. They're saying, no, let's go for single digit inflation. Is there room for a little bit more of inflationary spend, building up foreign reserves? 
So aid money is being used to build up foreign reserves rather than being thrown into education. I, th I think this is a huge reason for why we've got this problem in many countries and it's just not being acknowledged. Sorry, if I could just um, take up on that point. I, I'd be really interested in hearing from uh, Pacific Island governments if uh, the IMF was uh, a part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Um, but it's, it, it is very important to, uh, because that's not my experience, but uh, it, from my perspective it is very important to take a multi-agency approach to the human resources problem. That for too long ministries of education have been trying to solve uh, critical human resources problems themselves. And it really needs the engagement of ministries of finance, public service commissions and development partners recognising their impact on the system to solve problems such as the establishment, inflexibility in the establishment in the number of teachers. What happens in a number of Pacific Island countries is that because schools just don't have enough teachers under the formal establishment, they start hiring unqualified uh, teachers that they pay out of school grants. As a result, there's no money left in the school grants to provide learning materials or uh, teaching materials. Ad addressing that problem also needs uh, communities um, engagement um, as, as well as multiple uh, cross, uh, cross agency efforts. This, this is one of various problems which lends to uh, a recommendation for a systems wide approach to education rather than a project by project approach and that's where development partners can come in by providing well coordinated harmonised support led by uh, Pacific Island country decision making. On the question of how can communities get involved to help solve um, education problems, there's uh, a, a positive trend in many Pacific Island countries of national education boards and uh, school-based education boards. This is where uh, our recommendation of education systems delegating authority to the school level so that principals and communities together can uh, address uh, the development problems they face. But obviously at a national level it's also necessary to have that dialogue from church, the private sector and the community. Um, for instance in how to address curriculum. And curriculum is a very difficult issue. A number of Pacific Island countries have worked on um, outcomes based uh, curriculum systems which have been very difficult um, to implement because they require uh, better trained teachers and more resources and uh, the system isn't uh, providing either of those inputs that are required to make outcomes based curriculum work. So while we all recognise that it's critical for um, Barbara's education experience to improve for instance through better qualified uh, and uh, ad ad more teachers uh, and uh, a better curriculum being delivered, it requires a multi-stakeholder response. And uh, for us to be honest as development partners, where we're providing distortions or constraints on the system, um, and, f uh, and if we are providing constraints, we need to clean up our act. Okay, we've got uh, time for one or two quick questions, please. Thank you, Kirk Huffman. I'm honorary curator of the Vanuatu Culture Centre and with, on the scientific committee of the museum in Tahiti. Uh, and have positions at, honorary positions at the Australian Museum here and uh, the McLean Museum at the University of Sydney. Um, we're very lucky to have Barbara here. She's from the Western Quayo area on the island of Malaita, up in the mountains behind, uh, and I'm an anthropologist, up in the mountains behind where Barbara comes from, uh, is a very large population that refused to send their children to school. Uh, and it's similar to a certain number of populations in Vanuatu, uh, not in the area that Felicity worked in, but in the larger outer islands like Tana, Santo, parts of Malakula. I mean, there are populations that refuse modern education because there's a fear that it shortens the memory. And also it's because it's very, very closely associated with missionization. And some of the populations don't want anything to do with either the churches or with modern education. But there's another situation whereby in Vanuatu it's a little bit different. We were the only place in the Pacific that was a colony of two colonial powers at the same time, England and France. And so you've got two modern educational systems available. Huh? So very often what happens in some areas, parents might send one child to an English-speaking school, one child to a French-speaking school to balance your contacts with the modern world, one child you will not send to school because you hedge your bets. You're not sure if the modern world actually is sustainable. So you, you bring your third child up, the other child up, in custom. You don't send him to school so he, 
changes the brain by having to learn to read and write. That, that's a very good point, because okay? yes. as I said, I've got, I've got to cut off because yes. we're running short of time. What I might do is just take your point and, and flip it slightly and, and so to ask you, Barbara, um, what do you think would make uh, village schools in a place like Solomon, Solomon Islands or in Vanuatu better? Uh, how, how can we improve them? I think like, the problem is the teachers. I mean, it's not them, but like, because they aren't trained, so like, they teach the st uh, students and then when the students grow up and then they, like, example, they become teachers and they teach the same thing that teachers teach them. So I think it's better to have, like, better trained teachers in the schools or something. Yeah. Okay, then. Thank you very much for, for coming today. It's been a, it's been a very interesting and, and quite a varied uh, discussion because we've had uh, both the, the professional um, NGO overview and we've also had the, the experiential as well, which has been excellent. So uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much to Archie Law, to Felicity Mitchell, to Barbara Adele Fenome, uh, and to Stephen Close. Uh, you can watch uh, this um, version of Praxis at www.worldbank.org forward slash PI or www.the-diplomat.com. Uh, Praxis will return next month. In the meantime, thank you very much. <laughs>